Hello, and welcome to FACT's webinar, Silver Pasture on a Shoestring. Our guest presenter is Joshua Green. I'm Samantha Gasson, FACT's Humane Pro Farming Program Manager, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we dive right in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit headquartered in Illinois that works to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers through our humane farming program, promoting policies that make foods from animals safe and healthy to eat through our safe and healthy foods program, and generally help consumers make informed food choices. Please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. At this time, I am very pleased to introduce our, uh, introduce our esteemed presenter, Joshua Green. Joshua joined Trees for Graziers as the Director of Education and Agroforestry Consultant after a de decade of dodging falling ash trees and grazing cattle at Green Kitchen Farms. He, is, he has fond childhood memories of climbing pecan trees with his grandfather, who taught him the value of nuts, which is that they are good eating. He hopes to inspire generations of graziers to, to create cool, productive perennial silver pastures. Joshua makes his home in northeastern Pennsylvania with his wife and children who love to drink coffee, burn firewood, breathe fresh air, play the occasional game of Scrabble, and watch the grass grow. We are very lucky to have Joshua with us today to share his experience and expertise. So without further ado, I would turn the floor over to you, Joshua, and uh, feel free to please take it away, and I will share that poll, um, the poll results for you so you can see. Okay, thank you very much. You are very Great to welcome. be with you guys. Can you see my screen okay? No, not right now. All right, let's try again here. There you go, okay. now we can see it. How about now? Okay, yeah. great. Uh, it's great to be with you guys uh, this afternoon and talk about civil pasture on a shoestring. <clears throat> um, to start with, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about where I come from and what I'm doing, and then I'll try to dive into uh, some of the things that we think about in setting up Silva Pasture, and then some ideas for trying to do it on a, on a budget. Um, when I started uh, working for Trees for Grazers, they gave me access to a drone, which is a lot of fun to see uh, your cattle livestock from the air. And so you can see cattle as they move through the pasture. That's a, That's been a lot of fun. Um, before I get to my home farm, just a little bit about my roots. Um, my, I grew up uh, going to my grandfather's farm in North Carolina and my grandfather was part squirrel I like to say he uh, planted about a hundred acres of pecan trees as a hobby and uh, he was actually a doctor by trade and a farmer by night and uh, my dad talks about the ways in which he would come home and jump on the tractor or go work on the farm until two or three in the morning and then go back to work but he as a uh, part squirrel, he was unsettled unless he had at least two chest freezers full of pecans. And so as I grew up, uh, we would go in these trees. I would climb these trees and shake them. And my grandfather and all the grandkids and aunts and uncles would scurry around and, and collect these nuts. And, uh, he planted them in open pastures, irrigated them, and then over time, it was too big of a project, and some of the trees weren't that weren't as close to the homestead um, were taken down, and my uncle grazed uh, cattle right under those same trees, and uh, he was he's still grazing cattle, not as big into it as he once was, but. The cattle used to hang out under these pecan trees, and so as kids, this was kind of our our hangout. It wasn't a probably a real productive rotational grazing system, 
like we like to see, but it kind of set this planted the seeds for me to be interested in in silvopasture agroforestry. Um, so here's my farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents moved to Pennsylvania when I was about nine or 10. So it's pretty much like home for me, even though we would still travel back to North Carolina. It's my grandfather's farm. And we have about 70 acres of grazing land. And most of the fence lines that you're seeing there are uh, two strand subdivision fences. And uh, we've, we have some uh, sort of open pastures when we got there that were pretty brushy. And, um, and then we also had places like this on the farm that had been neglected for about, oh, 15 or 20 years. And so there were significant stands of black walnut. Actually, there were significant stands of ash trees that have succumbed to the emerald ash borer. So we've been doing some some thinning um, and some, some planting on our farm. We planted um, in this pasture we're planning to plant this year with about a about a thousand more stems and um, we're just trying to increase the shade availability around the farm we also raise uh, pasture poultry we do about a thousand birds a year and process those on the farm and we raise a few a few turkeys for thanksgiving we enjoy having those on pasture so and that's kind of a little bit about my context and um i would like to shift gears to to focus on silvopasture and i know you guys have had some really good webinars on this before um i think i watched one that steve gabriel did but it's the integration of kind of three components forages livestock and trees it's not uh, so dense as this, and I'm going to show you a few examples of, of things that won't work well for silvopasture, maybe other agroforestry applications. This is actually um, from Brett Chedzoy's farm in Watkins Glen, New York. And while this has trees and forages and he does graze cattle through this, uh, this stand, it's really too dense of a stand uh, to really have productive forage. Um, he has a lot of what he calls living barns uh, that are coniferous uh, evergreen plantings. But this one is is really serving as a way of uh, producing um, locust posts, uh, locust trees for posts, and then black walnut. And it'll be thinned out um, soon. Here's another planting, which is some spruce trees and red osier dogwood. Again, this would make a, a wonderful windbreak uh, and doesn't appear to be a uh, productive pasture, but again, not an integration of those three components, rather kind of a separation of those. Um, this is an Austri willow planting that is again, sort of like a, a windbreak. It's eight years old and it stands at about 40 feet tall. So it does show you something of the potential of being able to get shade in your pastures in, in a short time, again, eight years. But silva pasture, uh, it's, it's hard for us to conceptualize a lot of the, I think, density of trees, but it's really close to something like 35% shaded. And so a lot of our plantings are going to be something around 30 to 40 stems per acre, at least when those trees are mature. So down south, uh, there's a lot of pine silvopasture. pasture. Uh, in the Carolinas, a lot of a lot of planted pines. Um, where I live, there might be uh, an orchard silvopasture, pasture, where those cattle or sheep or whatever herbivores can graze the grasses around those trees. And you've seen uh, the Spanish dehesa, where the Iberico pork is produced which is another example of sort of um, the tree spacing that we're looking for. If you kind of count up and look at how much shade you're getting and how much open, um, open canopy for sunlight there is. And then you can also see 
uh, really intensive uh, sort of coppice type uh, silva pasture, which is again, this was more grown for the fodder than than perhaps the um, the forges underneath. And then the one that I've been motivated by it, I kind of grew up watching National Geographic, um, where the the chase seemed to be the climax of every episode. And so you're looking at these herbivores being uh, chased by carnivores. Again, a very wide tree spacing. So these grasses are really not at all inhibited uh, by the shade. Uh, and I've recently um, been uh, intrigued of the New Zealand um, live stake establishment, where they really have live stake nurseries everywhere. And they're really needing soil conservation because their soils are quite thin and, and sloughing off the hillsides. And so they begin to reclaim these hills by uh, planting willows and poplars, mostly willows as live stakes. And then as you see in the tree in the middle, these trees are pollarded in midsummer. And basically guys come in with a, a small ladder that ties to the tree and a small top handled chainsaw. And completely- hey, jo Josh, Joshua, can I just interrupt you for just one second? I'm sorry. The photo you just had, there's been a couple of questions in the chat as to where is that again? Right here or the previous one? I think it's the that one. That's an African savanna. Okay. Sorry. No, he said, sorry. What is the location of the last photo where you said it was grown for fodder? The one before, Anne says. Sorry. I'm not sure. I'm not seeing that slide in front of me. Sorry. I don't know. I'll have to check on that. That was a slide that Austin had. Are you talking about this one? I think so, yes. I'm not sure what country that's in, actually. This is in uh, this is in New Zealand. And so they actually purposely plant all these willows, mostly to feed sheep for summertime, as well as soil conservation. So I want to swing around to the subject of shade because I've been talking about tree density. And as you're thinking about establishing silvopasture on your farm, there's some things that we think about for shade. And the first one is tall shade. And you obviously cannot get shade that's high up in the sky right away. It takes some time. But you can try to encourage your trees to grow tall um, by, or at least have that taller shade by limbing the lower limbs. And so we also like to plant in six foot tree shelters that really encourage those trees to, to shoot up and not to send out as many lateral branches. When we maintain maintenance trees every year, we look for those lower uh, side branches and tend to cut those off. I also want to look for a dappled shade. And so the leaf habit, the leaf density of that tree will will determine that. We like locusts, locust trees for that reason. I like black walnuts for that same reason. Um, we can talk about different ways of moving shade around based on orientation of planting. Planting trees north to south will cause the shade to move more than east and west plantings. And the shade needs to be distributed well. And I have a few examples of that a little bit later. And I also really like late shade. That is trees that are going to be the last ones to leaf out after your forages have already um, begun growing and uh, leaves that that present later in the spring. So here's an example. This is a rising locust farm in Lancaster County. Um, Harrison Rhodes, who works for Trees for Grazers, planted this farm. Um, and you get a little sense here, there's not a lot of trees per acre. Um, this one's planted on contour. And as, as you look over there near that, I think it's a, a poultry shed that's getting pulled along the paddocks, each paddock is having several points of shade. 
but there's no competition really for, for forages. Here's a, a slide from my farm. And uh, what I see is that over time, the trees on my tree line really might be a, a detriment to my farm. They're going to provide shade for the cattle, some respite from the heat. But they're also going to continue to draw nutrients and impact toward that one spot along my tree line. So that's an example of, of kind of uh, not well distributed shade that we want to avoid. Um, in the next slide, I'm going to try to play this video without maybe hearing the sound. At least a little, this one's a little shorter. So what you can see is like my cows are hand, hanging out under a mulberry. And if I look to the other tree, they're all under that one uh, Bradford pear, which it happens to be. So every time I graze those cattle there, I'm gonna in the summer, I'm gonna have all the nutrients and compaction kind of in that one spot. So I really wanna look for, for distributed shade throughout the paddock, multiple points of, of shade. In some ways, uh, in terms of nutrient management, maybe not animal comfort, no trees might be better than one tree on the farm. Again, I enjoy watching the cattle come to uh, any tree in a paddock, and they tend to just migrate toward them. Uh, this is a crab apple tree, and uh, they just had um, a wonderful time eating crab apples this summer. Here's a black locust tree, and what I'd like you to see in this in this slide is just the light canopy, probably in in uh, I believe this is in May, and the cool season forages are have all done. They're all leafed out. There's a full solar canopy on the on the on the ground, um, but just not a heavy leafed tree. And just for a little context, this tree is about four years old, and uh, the tree shelter is six feet tall. So if you kind of extrapolate that or use your use your thumbnail, it's it's probably about a twenty to twenty five foot tree in about four years. In the studies of silva pasture, one of the, the things that really sold me on the need for it were the studies on the cool season pr productivity. And one of the best studies has been done in Virginia Tech, where as you look at the cool season spring flush of grass, when they've you know, clipped all the forages, dried them out, measured the dry matter, the cool seasons in the spring are slightly less productive under uh, under shade. But as you move forward to the summer slump, where in this slide you'll see like the warm season annuals, those cool season forages under trees produce more in those July, August, September uh, warm, warm days. And so for me, I'm, in my context, we have plenty of grass in May and June, but it's really that filling in that September, well, I should say early August that I'm looking for. And that, that makes, I think, a case that having some silver pasture on your farm is going to increase forage quality and quantity uh, during those hot times. Just a couple more trees to, to highlight. This is an elm tree. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of hope for elms. Uh, they seem to have died off. Um, there are a few hanging on in the farm. But here's a, a few black walnut trees. And um, notice how the grasses are in full bloom. Actually, you can see some dandelions in there. So I know I'm probably in uh, late May, maybe, maybe mid-May. But the black walnuts have not yet leafed out. In Virginia, a similar kind of uh, black walnut silva pasture. There was probably some dry cows. Um, I I push I put the date here on this slide so that you can see uh, what black walnuts will look like in our context in in middle of May. Uh, so they're just kind of a late uh, emerging uh, leaf.
We have a, a lot of um, work revolving around honey locusts. And I realized in some, uh, I noticed some of the places where folks are from is that uh, probably honey locusts might be banned there. We're working with a thornless uh, a variety of honey locusts. And then there's also a nurseryman from uh, the 1920s who collected a lot of honey locusts that were producing very productive pods, uh, upwards of around 30% sugar. And those pods hang on and don't drop until winter. And they keep really well, unlike apples um, and things that you might think of for summer fruit. There just aren't as many good winter fodder drop trees. Um, honey locust is one as well as persimmon. Uh, I had a persimmon, the first one that I tasted this spring in, uh, I believe it was in February. And it actually hung on the tree all winter. And it was still a nice, tasty fruit. And so that's another one with uh, with a lot of sugar that can hang on um, kind of in late late winter or early winter. Uh, another shot of apples. Um, I have pictures of my cattle um, eating mulberries. Oh. And uh, they just devour those. Uh, this is th These are black locusts. And so as Harrison here was... Uh, cleaning up, trimming up the lower limbs, the sheep were uh, devouring that. Now, I looked at um, some of the the different survey or the questions that came in earlier, and several people were interested in what are good uh, trees for poultry, for ducks, for, um, for hogs. And um, one of the really fascinating areas of potential silvopasture is is using mulberries um one of our favorite resources which i'll call attention to is called tree crops uh, by j russell smith and he um he writes about the ways in which people especially in the in the south were able to keep uh hogs uh fattened and growing on exclusively mulberries for their entire uh, growing life. Um, there's some wonderful passages in, in tree crops where he interviews farmers who were able to um, put 100 hogs under 40 mulberries for three months with nothing but the scraps from the kitchen table, and they were growing. And the mulberry is one of those weird fruits that has a high percentage of protein. It also has, there are varieties, almost all of these varieties are hybridized with the Chinese mulberry. So it's really hard to get pure strains of them, but there are cultivars that drop early and it's one of the first fruits to drop as well as you know dropping in July and August and September. So maybe I'll just uh, kind of come up for air a little bit and see if there's any um, questions, Samantha, that I could clarify since I feel like I'm moving pretty fast and don't get a lot of feedback yet. Okay. Um, yeah. You've got quite a few questions. Okay. Um, would shrubs for grazing goats be considered silver pasture? Sure. I suppose. Uh, I think it's a great, great to have um, some woodies, some woody shrubs in for goats and sheep. Um Often I'm talking about different forages in the pasture sward and, and arguing that, you know, we need to have bushes, uh, shrubs, and trees. Whether it's considered silver pasture or not, I guess I think it's a good thing. Okay. Um, there's a there's a comment in the chat. Um, so Jennifer says she thinks it's the foliage that is high in protein in the mulberry, not the fruit. Um, I don't know if you have. It's it's actually, I believe that the fruits um, have the protein. I'm not saying that the leaves don't, but um, actually a high protein in the seeds of the uh, the fruit. Okay. Um, I can show some, well, I probably can't pull it up right this second, but we have some samples from the mulberry fruits. Oh, okay. Um, protein. I think we have it on our website. We have a study of that. Okay. Um, I would say though, I know the the leaves are very tasty. Uh, I've been eating them, and they're very sweet. They must have a high sugar sugar content as well. 
Right. Um, so Jess would like to know what kind of willow tree grew in eight years. And I would like to remind everybody to please put your questions in the Q&A because I'm not going to look at the chat. I mean, I will if we come to the end, but if you want your question answered, please put it in the Q&A. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are a lot of different hybrid willows um, that have different growth habits. Um, some of them grow straight and tall. Some of them are more bit uh, bushy, like you might have heard of like a stream co willow, which is a really common one for like conservation. The one in the photo was uh, a, a cultivar called Austri. A-U-S-T-R-E-E -E is, I believe, the spelling there. Okay. Um, Anne asks, when Joshua says he likes locusts, does he mean black locusts, honey locusts, both, or something else? I feel like you you sort of answered that a little bit. It I can try to clarify locusts. Locusts are hard. So black locusts are thorny when they're small. The small branches have thorns. But those thorns hang out at the top of the branches and so they're not a thorn problem but they don't have any they have pods little papery pods almost like a red bud tree or like a little dried out pea pod and so there's nothing of sugar there there's no really forage potential for it for the pods um, the honey locusts can be very thorny and when they're thorny they're nasty and so but those thorns don't present themselves often until three or four years. So as they're juvenile, they look very nice and they're soft. But the honeys are the ones that have the potential for those pods. So this is another research area for us. Like we're playing around trying to get root cuttings from some of these really good genetics trees that also don't have thorns. And then there are also male and female trees. So there's a couple other things there that to have they have to understand before we get into to honey locusts okay and jess asks uh for clarification was it black locusts that grew to 40 feet in 20 years um i would say oh yes black locusts honeys do grow slower um black locusts can really grow fast um 20 25 feet in four years yeah that, that's a pretty standard growth rate and i would also mention these are legumes so they do pump nitrogen into the soil as something like uh, clovers would okay wendy watch well, let me stick with locust for a few more um questions okay. here and then i'll get back to wendy's um jess said that two sheep on her farm overdosed on locust bean pods and died within the day is that something you've heard of i haven't heard of that no i'd be interested to learn how that happened yeah and a follow-up is um is black walnut toxic Black walnut is an allele, has a, a juglans toxin in the soil. Um, it's it affects nightshade. It's well known to ruin tomatoes and and uh, eggplants and potatoes. Um, it's not toxic to most grasses, um, and so I'm mostly interested in that. I think that livestock don't tend to prefer to eat very much of it, um, but it is something I think alfalfa may be affected by it. If, a, if you're interested in that as a, as a forage, I know probably down south you're not so much, but up here, we, uh, the dairy grazers would love to have more alfalfa. So they're, they're a little nervous about black walnuts. Okay. Um, so, and I think you just answered that question about preventing forage growth under the walnut can canopy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. so would you want to let me know from the poll? Um, so my, my next slide was kind of about different ways to get to silva pasture and i could focus a little bit on thinning the woods if that was interesting or more people are interested in planting trees we can kind of go that direction um i think there's a lot of questions about um planting trees preventing tree death and spacing we've got spacing. Three okay about. yeah okay well i'll just kind of like flash through the thinning the woods project it's got some advantages because you don't have to wait to get your shade you don't have to protect your trees as much. I mean, you still have to rotate cattle. Um, and then if you're so fortunate, you might have some valuable timber to help pay for that project. Um, one, it's really hard to move around in the woods. 
um, even if you've thinned it out. And so like, as far as getting forages in there, uh, many times we've had high graded uh, forests. So all the good trees have already been cut out. So the value is gone. And then, you know, so there's some, some challenges there. Um, I can also fly through this slide, but as I've been trying to wrap my head around how much the lumber is worth and the timber is worth in these these uh, silva pastures, it seems like having pasture in your woods is a great way to continue to grow trees, but um, it's probably worth more as pasture than it is uh, in wood. And that's mostly because you can only sell that wood once every 30 years. Um, one or two more points about thinning out woods and, and in my part of the world, we have very, we have all kinds of interesting invasive species. And so when you open up that canopy, you need to have a good plan for, um, getting forages established because as soon as that light hits the, the ground, you've, you've hit in the ground and stimulated growth, you're going to get in my area, I'm going to get oriental bittersweet. I'm going to get autumn olive, Japanese silk grass, um, Japanese barberry. And so unless I've got enough animal pressure and a, or a good um, seeding program, it's going to be tough. The other thing about thinning woods is that uh, it's not just moving the big trees. All of the intermediate story typically can compete with forages too. So we can talk more about that if there are questions. In terms of open pasture, uh, it's a long-term project. One of the most daunting parts of it is, is protecting trees. And then if you're looking at a blank slate, you get a lot more questions since you actually have to go and choose the species, the layout, protection system, and that sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, you can put the trees where you want them, and uh, theoretically, you could you can design a a system that will be that'll work with your goals and your sort of your vision, uh, your values. So I would like to s address the tree protection piece here for a bit, and and that's one that we've kind of worked hard on at trees for grazers because and. Where we work, we're working with mostly Lancaster County dairy grazers, where the land can easily be $70,000 an acre. So taking it out of production is not an option. And so we're really big on these, these plantra tree tubes. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that we can get them in the six foot height, but they have a fiberglass stake and that fiberglass stake is able to move to flex a bit with the wind. And so we think that helps, even though we're getting a taller tree, it's wanting to, to shoot up to get to the full light. It also gets some resilience by being um, moved around. And so we've already used uh, barbed wire to try to protect and wrap around these tree tubes. We tend not to do that if we don't have to. Uh, most of most grazers are using electric spark and it's a lot cheaper and, and more, more nimble. Uh, so sometimes we'll use tree tubes for paddock boundaries. Uh, so there, these guys are on a, a tour of Fiddle Creek dairy and you'll see on the left, there's a poly wire tied to those tree tubes. And so they actually become a sort of semi-permanent um, paddock boundary. Some ways that's kind of limiting um, if you're really into adaptive grazing because you want to be able to change your paddock dimensions. And so the other system that we use is we call it the overpass system. And so uh, what you're looking at is a tree tube with a hole punched in it right at about six feet in height. And then there's a piece of poly wire that's connected tube to tube. And then the little wire that's uh, twisted is in a piece of an aluminum wire. Um, that one is 14 gauge, but it's like 17 gauge aluminum wire is fine. Wrap it around the poly wire. 
and then spiral it down the tree tube and then tie it off. And you really want to have spark on these tree tubes um, in order to get your animals used to avoiding um, those tree tubes. Um, what I like to do is I just make a bunch of like, since we're talking about shoestring here, if I can get this in focus, oh, where am I? This is a, a piece of 55 gallon uh, drum just cut with two holes in it. And I'll hook the poly wire in one end. I'll hook the other end around my um, high tensile wire. And then I'll use a jumper clip to put spark on the, on the poly wires I need it. So the overpass system gives you a lot of flexibility. And there's a couple other good things about this is one of the things we worry about if we plant a bunch of trees in our pastures, how we're going to maintain them. And we really want the animals to do as much of that work as possible. And uh, just to try to limit the amount of uh, close weed whacking or things like that. The other thing that we do is we do use a lot of wood chips on our plantings. Um, after the trees are planted, the stakes are in, the tree, tree shelters are on, and then we will really mound up with about six or eight gallons of wood chips. And we do that for moisture protection to make the, the, uh, the soil environment a little more fungal. And that really gives those trees off to a good start. Here are some uh, some more black locusts. There's a little mix in there. There's a few willows. And um, I'll jump into a few hints or ideas for keeping the, the price of a silver pasture ch um, cheap, or at least more on the lower end. And one of those is, is to use live stakes. And live stakes in wet climates are really a cheap way of establishing a lot of trees. And so these are dormant cuttings, again, probably from a willow or a poplar. Uh, there are several, some people have asked about um, bushes for goats. There are, um, there's false indigo, another native uh, legume and lots of other trees that stake, but not all that do. And so we're moving toward larger and larger uh, live stakes to establish quick shade. So these are cut while they're dormant. Um, you essentially pound them into the ground or press them into the ground with a pounder. And uh, they they do quite well. Here's an example of a a poplar that's two years old and it's got enough shade for one cow and uh, she's not gonna move. So here's your little, here's a really basic silver pasture planting list. Gotta have a plan because you want it, when you put a tree in the ground, you want it to be in the right place. Tree stock, a tree protection system and some kind of aftercare plan. Now, ideally, if you're talking about a site plan, it'd really be great to have a whole farm plan before you start planting trees. So you, you can you can uh, think about where you might be moving equipment. Are there places where you need to be able to see? Are there places where you want to make hay or potentially do, you know, cultivate for crops? But after that, what are ways that you can sort of save some money so this the shoestring silvo strategy number one this has got two little parts to it and this is pretty obvious but if you can plant it yourself uh, you can save a lot of money if you can mulch it yourself you can save a lot of money um, there's some other nice things about digging holes for your own trees you got some sweat equity in your project you're going to learn a lot about your soils and if you go to any kind of soil health seminar, they're going to tell you if, like Ray Archuleta says, dig a little and you're, you'll learn a lot. You're going to know what the soils look like all over your farm. And then after you dig those holes, uh, you're really going to care about those trees. And then, of course, mulching is one of those things that it's a great evening activity. And many of you can get you know, free wood chips. Hardwood chips are great. Um, softwood chips would be fine too. They just break down a bit quicker. Josh, so plant it yourself, alter yourself. 
Can I can I add in one uh, question, oh. one comment? I feel like it's very applicable to this slide. Yes. Um, Anne says she has a lot of low wool, low value wool available. Um, what do you think about that as using as a mulch, uh, like a low quality wool? And so it's a great idea. I will only can only explain our experience with it. In the Northeast, we have a lot of voles. Uh, voles are kind of like almost like moles and they're kind of public enemy number one for silvo pasture planting. Um, they're rodents that like to live um, they, in the thicker the pasture is, the more uh, productive they seem to be. So it seems like that might make a really nice vole habitat, in which case um, you wouldn't want to encourage that. I know when we tried it with coconut mats, which is kind of a similar thing, but it was something that we could get um, cheaply and move around easily. They were great for the crew because we could just slap down coconut mats around the trees. But that turned out to be a vole, vole um, condominium. So we abandoned that one. Second, uh, shoestring silvo strategy would be to start your own live stake nursery as i mentioned on these cuttings um, especially if you have some wetter areas on your farm if you can plant out um, some trees that you might like to use on your operation if they're live stakeable you can plant your first row and then every other year you can harvest your own live stakes and so that's a great way to um, increase your the number of trees that you can establish and also these are not things that easily ship um, we are uh, cutting something like eight or ten foot stock and so if you get a big pile of these it's a whole truckload and so they're really things that we would like to see um, regionally established and um, it's going to take a little bit of patience but you're going to get exponential growth uh, down the stretch. The third strategy would be to recycle tree shelters. This is one of the biggest costs for silvo pasture planting. For us, the planter tree tubes are, you know, they, they cost about $10 a piece. So it's easily the biggest line item. It's even bigger than the cost of the tree. But we're in our area, we have riparian buffer planters where the success rate was about one in 10 trees. And so there are tree tubes uh, just everywhere that you, that could be had just with the permission of the landowner and um, a little bit of labor to go out and recycle them. And plus you'd kind of clean up, uh, clean up a site. So kind of give a second life to those tree shelters. Um, it's also important to think about starting with easy to work with species, uh, cheap trees. Um, you don't want to start your silver pasture by buying like $45 grafted apple trees. Uh, good species to work with would be you know, some of these uh, black locusts or any kind of bare root trees that are native to your region. Um, you might even get the conservation grade uh, trees that your conservation district would, would offer. And uh, they don't have to be containerized trees. We find uh, better results with bare root trees than we do with um, trees in containers. So that'd be my suggestion is to, to start with a lot of cheaper trees. And then this is one really big on um, phasing your project. When we do a plan for a whole farm, maybe somebody has a vision to plan out 100 acres of trees. We'll say, all right, we're going to start with two acres or maybe five. Um, if they're all in, we'll, we maybe do a, a larger planting. But it's really important to get started in a small way so that you can learn as you go. I um, mean, if you put in 500 trees and they all, you lose them all, it's going to hurt bad and you're probably going to not want to do it again. But if you planted 25 trees, it would not be nearly as, as painful. Um, but you don't want to wait until you have the money for the whole thing, perhaps as well, because if you can start, you can learn, you can see what's working well and how your animals 
um, behaved around the trees. And so I really encourage people to plant, do a small planting close to your homestead, close to your home where you can kind of watch it and see what trees are really going to grow well there and then learn the ropes in that way. Uh, there were several questions about silvopasture funding opportunities. And this really changes a lot depending on where you live. Uh, NRCS is you know, throughout all the states, but it really depends on the state as to which standards they adopt or which practices they, they will pay on. Um, in Pennsylvania, silvopasture is not a, a supported practice. So that's truly really not an option for like getting equip funding. Um, but there are several other practices that are related that might uh, qualify. For example, if you live in a watershed that, or if you, you have some riparian zones um, on your farm, some creeks that need to be um, protected, you might be able to plant a good distance from that creek in order to, for that, that planting kind of be a, uh, an option. Windbreaks are supported in most states. And then alley cropping is something that's plant um, that's uh, an option in Pennsylvania. And to qualify, the, the planting would have to be probably a wider spacing and not so distributed. But it'd be something where if you had a an idea of making hay or making crops for a few years, um, you could eventually get that into pasture after that practice life had expired. Um, CSP is the Conservation Stewardship Program, and it wouldn't necessarily pay for silvo pasture, but if you, you sign up for that program, um, you can use that money every year for um, adding to your silvo pasture. And then state by state, there are a lot of water quality programs. It really depends on where you live. We live in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and so it's been such a degraded watershed that there's a lot of money in certain counties um, for water quality. And sometimes that distance from the creek can be quite large. Uh, many times the soil and water districts, uh, in our state, they call them conservation districts. Uh, they're often very willing and able to help with uh, silvopasture projects. And then one of the bottlenecks for many of these different types of programs is to try to get planning. And in Pennsylvania, they have a, a state program that's like farm vitality or farm succession planning. And sometimes those, um, those funds can be used for writing a plan. And so it doesn't matter where the funds come from. Many times, typically there's no planning money. And so that we find is a bottleneck because you want to apply for a grant for silver pasture, but you don't have any maps or number of trees and species of trees. So that can be a bottleneck. And so those might be places to look for uh, some planning money. Um, we do send out some emails as we find funding for silver pasture. And I can mention a few. The Nature Conservancy has one called um, Expanding Agroforestry Program. Um, I believe the Food Animal Concerns Trust has many grants, and most of those are geared around providing um, animal health or transitioning land into pasture, so they might be uh, potential ones as well. So start small, start now, start small, and uh, use something like the Fibonacci series to think about your pasture uh, planning. And um, you can move from 25 to 50 to 100 to 1,000 trees there. Here's a few of the resources that we like to, uh, to highlight. We're really big fans of Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith. It's an old book, but it seems like its ideas haven't really been applied widely. And I mentioned Trees of Power and uh, Steve Gabriel's book. And then Austin wrote The Grazer's Guide to Trees. And I also have a bunch of links here. And I think those can be pasted into the email that you get from Samantha um, as far as our resources for like silvopasture specific trees. 
So that's kind of the the end of my slides. I kind of whipped through a bunch of different topics there, but maybe we can dial in on a few if you have questions and we have time. Yeah, and I just to let everybody know, I I will put those in the follow up um, email. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, we've got quite a few questions here and not a huge amount of time, so <laughs> let's get started. Um, so Christine asks if you're started with if you're starting with a wooded area that you would like to thin out and open up uh, to, to, and become silver pasture, how would you recommend uh, determining which tree species slash type slash spacing and remove the best options for dealing with stumps and understory plants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it can be difficult because a lot of the trees that you want to get rid of are lower value trees. So you typically want to I would recommend if you have any, if you have foresters in your area, you really want a forester to look at your land. Somebody who can, uh, he's going to measure the trees, diameter, breast height, DBH. He's going to look at how many logs um, those trees are and really get a forest inventory. That's the first thing I would do. In addition, not many people know this, but if you're going to sell timber, it's going to be considered a capital gains. And so, uh, especially if you do it right away when you move to a new farm, but you need to have a forester write a plan and establish your basis. That way you basically have a number or a value there of the timber when you bought your farm. And that way, when you sell it, you don't pay taxes on the whole amount because mm -hmm. if you pay taxes on the whole amount, it look it acts as if you just planted the tree when you got there, but you actually bought trees that were already there. So there's a lot I could say about this in terms of the economics, but um, you would probably want to leave some really good seed trees there uh, for um, for future. It might be trees that need to be released, which is opening up the canopy so those trees can really grow and they might be good harvestable trees in 20 years. If you're thinking about that's that's mostly about the timber. As far as getting rid of those stumps, um, forestry mulchers can do the job, but they can be really about two thousand dollars an acre to actually cover that ground. So that can be a that could be a challenge. Okay. There's a lot to go on that, but <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a big question. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and launch our after um, our end of webinar poll. I know you still are answering questions, but this okay. is um, very useful for us when we're trying to get funding and that kind of thing. And I'm doing a bunch of reporting right now. And so I've been using this information, guys. So please answer the poll. All right. Um, Andrew would like to know, uh, could you say again, what stems per acre you're recommending and the spacing between the rows? Okay. I didn't mention any uh, spacing, but if you're looking at 30 to 40 stems per acre, uh, a lot of times it might be 40 to 50 feet between rows and then 40 feet um, in, in row spacing. So if you kind of figure that a tree would have a maybe 20 by 20 square foot canopy uh, over time, that's 400 square feet. And if you multiply that by 40 trees, you're going to end up with a number that's what around 16,000 square feet and an acre is 43,000 square feet. So you're going to get about 30% shade. So that was a lot of numbers, but 40 stems per acre <laughs> is 40 feet between rows and about 40 or 50 feet in row spacing. Okay. So Bruce would like to know what other true trees produce nitrogen besides the locust tree? Honey locust, black locust, false indigo, and uh, mimosa is also in that family. There's probably other trees in the Fabaceae family that you could look for, but those are really the main ones that I know of. Okay. I think the Kentucky coffee tree might be in that family. Okay. So further south, that might be an option. So Jess uh, was the one who's talked about her sheep dying and uh -huh. she did a follow up or um, he or she did a follow up and said that they had a necropsy done and the sheep had eaten a lot of locust bean pods that were concentrated on a compost pile. So just in case anybody was wondering. Oh, that's interesting to know that. 
you know, many, many times when I hear about toxicity or animal death, it seems like it was almost the only option for those animals or it was the only thing that they were ate, eaten. And in a mob grazing kind of context, I, I th tend to think there's going to be competition for those limited resources more so. Okay. Kim says, if thinning the forest, how helpful is winter hay feeding in the clearings for like free hay seed? Oh, that, I mean, that's a great option. It just depends on the one thing to be concerned is with muddy kind of uh, conditions is that you can get a lot of, com a lot of impact on those tree roots. And then in my cattle, as you get later into winter, they get more and more uh, lice and their hair coat is starting to shed off and they get itchy and they really want to rub on those trees. So it's just a kind of a situation where the hay itself, putting seed on the ground and, and the impact of that bale grazing could be really good. But um, you just want to watch those trees and make sure they don't start to get any, you know, get rubbed too hard. Wendy asks, um, open pasture scenario, have you seen any successful examples of doing more of a permaculture angle with trees not planted in a row, but more in organic forms? Or do you find that the much thinner? Okay. That's a really interesting question. And I think we're interested in piloting um, projects like that because in what we see in nature is we see clumps of trees. And so we really think that has a lot of uh potential benefit the trees themselves seem to have some synergy we have not done plantings like that um but i can especially see a kind of node and uh and path pattern that would be really effective okay. so Love we are try. right we're right <laughs> at four o'clock um josh joshua are you okay with staying on maybe a few yes minutes? i'm not in a rush i'm happy Okay, so around. we well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time in the audience as well. So we'll maybe go five more minutes over. Um, we still have a lot of questions, <laughs> but we're I don't think we're gonna to get to all of them, but we'll try. Okay, Jared um would like to know what's the best way for preparing to plant trees in a competitive grass pasture like brome? Should he in use pillage? Should he use landscape mud fabric or mulch? Or some, what's this, what he's asking? We tend to not to do any prep before our planting, um, mostly because we're spacing so widely. If we, if it was a denser planting, we'd probably try to rip through there with, um, you know, with maybe like a subsoiler or a cultivator in thin rows. But that's why we're a big fan of the heavy wood chips. Um, so if we dig a hole and we flip all that sod upside down as we plant the tree and pile those wood chips on there, weed pressure tends to be pretty low but we also come back in year two and add wood chips um grab and rip out weeds but as long as they're not actually competing with the tree and the tree is established after two years it's not usually a problem so jennifer had a really interesting comment and it's very timely that i'm reading her question right when you just said that she said have you ever had problems with mice nesting inside the base of the tree tubes when the tree tubes, when the wood chips are mounted on it? She's found that it makes a cozy spot for them to nest and they've been girdling the trees. Oh, the mice have. Um, I don't know that the mice have been the major girdler. I, I, I should say we probably haven't identified all the little rodents that are in there. Um, I will mention a couple other things that we tend to do um, in our plantings. We take a little piece of that spiral uh, tree protection and we put that right at the base of the tree. And that's like, we, you know, they typically come at about three feet long. We cut them into about three or four pieces. We want about that much of that tree stem covered with that. The other thing that we... All right. Is it just me? Yeah. Is it just me or is uh, Joshua <laughs> frozen? All right. Well, I'm actually going to go to, I'm going to share my screen and it's not, okay. Thank you, everybody. It's not just me. Okay.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and we can we can move on. Um, it looks like he, he got off. All right, well, we may be at the end of the webinar, even though we didn't mean to be. So um, just a couple of quick announcements. Next week we are, oh, good, he's back. Next week we're very lucky to have another web. All right, Joshua, you're back. Okay, that's, that's <laughs> you're on mute though. So get off mute and let's get going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right i'm back on task sorry my internet died. <laughs> i thought it was me because my internet always stinks but anyway okay uh just a couple more questions so chris asked uh, he he has a suggestion um he was said that um wool pellets are becoming an option they break down quickly and they provide nitrogen have you heard of wool wool w-o-o-l pellets and that no would i have not I mean, that, sounds like that we, might be something interesting. We've talked about wool because so many uh, sheep, you know, wool growers, not not wool growers, sheep growers tend to just throw their wool out. And it just seems like it's a nice natural material that would do the yeah. job. That yeah. might be the ticket. Thanks. Um, and uh, Christine would like to know what species are live stake options? Um, most of the willows will live stake. Many things that hang out around the creeks will live stake. Um, some of the slower growers, I think like tulip poplar and sycamore don't do it very well. Um, the poplars and aspens do. I mentioned false indigo. I believe box elder will live stake. Um, it's one of those things where we don't have really great data on it. And our nursery guy is doing like a whole set of trials with live staking everything this spring and just to keep tabs on what really does well. And I think what we're going to find is something like the ones that we've mentioned are all a really high percent rate. And we might find others that don't stake as successfully, but will still work. And it's still a win if you make it work. So Joshua, there's several questions about um, just some of, of the suppliers you have. Uh, would you mind sending those uh, links to maybe the uh, the tree tube supplier? I think that's the main one you've asked, and maybe okay. some places. Sure. If you could just either just actually, if you wouldn't mind just putting them in the chat right now, that would be great. Okay, I can do that. If if you go to um, the oh, well, I'm in the Q and A here. So in Trees for Grazers, we sell the Plantra tree tubes. You can also get them right from Plantra. But um, we have a nursery recommendations list that is available on our website. It's, um, let's see, I'll try to put this in here. Trees. And then um, I'll grab the. All right. And I can, you can also just email it to me, Joshua, and I'll send it in the. Um, I'll send it in the follow-up email. Yeah, I think that link will work. Yeah. All right. So Wendy asks, um, this is talking about live staking again, how much success do you have in uh, more arid areas in the West? I think, uh, well, we don't work out in, in the West, so I can't, can't speak to that at all. Um, but I think poplar would be a more, um, it, it requires some, moisture to get going but it doesn't require as much wet wet feet like some like the willows would okay all right we've let's just do one more question okay okay sorry ah there's so many it's so hard to choose um what are your thoughts on living mulches like perennial rye or white clover um, using those, well, we think hay mulch has a lot of potential away in many of our situations, there's nice pasture grass that needs to be, that could just be swath, you know, hay bind swath raked right almost onto the row. So I think that's got a lot of potential. I'm not sure if they're talking about like using it as almost like a, a cover crop, but I think that that could be that could be solid you just want to you don't want to compete with those trees for a couple of years and i think you'll be off to the races um, right. somebody mentioned about ash trees um <clears throat> harvest them as soon as i can um <laughs> i know many times if they're still standing they're almost all already rotten in the tops 
unfortunately I didn't get many of mine as far as stumps. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. I think you're just going to have to work at it with, uh, with the stump grinder, if you can get one, that'd be a nice way, but that are giving a few years and you'll be able to pull them out with a loader bucket. All right. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and end things now. I'm going to go ahead and stop my, stop the recording.